The Orlando Magic made their big trade with the Denver Nuggets last March. Last March, we're going to check in on how Gary Harris and RJ Hampton played in their first years with the Orlando, first full seasons with the Orlando Magic. As player evaluations continue to begin, I don't know where we're at with those, but we're going to get into it on today's Locked On Magic. You are Locked On Magic, your daily Orlando Magic podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. And you are indeed locked on magic. Today is April 27th, 2022. My name is Philip Ross and I'm the expert insight editor over at Orlando Magic Daily.com. Of course, follow me on Twitter at Philip RR underscore OMD. On today's episode of Locked On Magic, we're going to dive into some player evaluations, try and catch up on those a little bit by focusing in on Gary Harris and RJ Hampton. How did the Magic's two players that they acquired in their deal with the Denver Nuggets play? in their first full seasons with the Orlando Magic, perhaps their last full seasons with the Orlando Magic, as anything can happen now, that it is the offseason. We'll get to that coming up here in just a moment. But before we do that, we want to thank you for making Locked On Magic part of your day every day. No matter when you listen to us, whether it's first thing in the morning, whether it's right when we upload, whenever, we truly appreciate you making Locked On Magic part of your day every day. Remember, the Locked On Podcast Network is a great place to get all your information for any team, really, in the NBA, NFL, NHL, MLB, or college, too. Check it out wherever you download podcasts or for Locked On, the team you're looking for, the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. We've been kind of bouncing around a little bit. Um, I have, I've been a little bit neglectful in my season recap stuff, so I want to dive right into, se- into season recaps and player evaluations here. We've done Wendell Carter a little bit. We did Franz Wagner a little bit. Um, earlier uh, uh, last week when we named Franz Wagner our, our season MVP. Um, but I do want to really hit on each player uh, and how they played, especially the key players. Um, and I think RJ Hampton is actually a really good place to start. Um, a, a, you know, the Orlando Magic made this really big move, obviously, to, to trade Aaron Gordon. They got RJ Hampton as a rookie. They got Gary Harris to match salaries. They got a future first-round pick coming in 2025 from Denver. Um it was uh, it was probably the riskiest of the three deals, but obviously the one they had to make because of what Aaron Gordon asked, asked for. When RJ Hampton arrived in Orlando, nobody really knew what to make of him. Um, COVID, a the Denver Nuggets just did not have the time for a raw but talented young guard, um, and COVID really slowed him down. Actually, when the Magic acquired him, RJ Hampton had just cleared COVID protocols, um, and, and he barely played to that point anyway, and so. This was really an opportunity for R.J. Hampton to play more consistently, to get more time on the floor, and actually get a chance to play regular minutes. Um, that is, that's what a- any young player would ask for. Um, we saw immediately last year how fast R.J. Hampton was, and, and how quickly he was able to get, get down the floor and, and attack in the op- in the open court. The question was always going to be, how does he hone these skills? How does he kind of fine-tune these skills and carve himself a role in his career? His first full season with the Magic didn't really shed a whole ton of light on that. It didn't get – sorry, I'm going to have to plug in here. Um, It it didn't get all those questions answered about who R.J. Hampton's going to be in this league and where he fits. But the Magic did try to make some clarity, did try to create some clarity in what he what they were trying to get out of him. Hampton had some really good minutes. He played 60, played 64 of the Magic's games this season, averaged 21.9 minutes per game, averaged six, 7.6 points per game, two and a half assists per game. His shooting percentages jumped to 35% from beyond the arc, although he struggled overall at 38.3%. Essentially what the Magic turned him into, what the Magic were trying to turn him into, what the Magic were trying to carve out for his role, was as a 3 and D wing. They went very far out of their way throughout the course of the season to avoid playing him at point guard. They didn't want him with the ball in his hands consistently, kind of running the team. They, they just did not see that as his strength. And if you watched him play, he'd be moving too fast with the ball. He'd be trying to do too much too quickly. He'd make a lot of mistakes. He'd make a lot of turnovers. He never really had Jamal Mosley's trust as a, a point guard, but he had his trust as kind of a disruptive defender. It's like an energetic wing defender. And he was a good enough three-point shooter that he had to keep 
uh, that he was able to keep defenses fairly honest. Um, his three-point shooting did tail off at the end of the season, but he was largely shooting up near 40% from beyond the arc, which suddenly becomes a really valuable tool for Orlando. So this is really what the focus was all year, was getting RJ Hampton to slow down and really find comfort in a role, in the way the Magic wanted him to play. Um, Again, no one should doubt this guy's talent. Uh, you know, there's a reason why he was able to go jump straight from high school over to, to Australia to play in the NBL. And as much as he struggled there, which again, was a lot of decision-making, a lot of just kind of understanding the speed of the game. Um, he is still an incredibly talented player. There's no reason anyone should be giving up on RJ Hampton. And he played well this year. He did good things this season, but there was a lot of growing pains. In a lot of ways, this was his rookie year because he played so little his sophomore, his first year last year. And because he came over in a trade, it's almost like he was starting from square one. Like he was starting from scratch when he arrived in Orlando. And especially when this season started, especially with his third coach now in two seasons. Uh, you know, obviously Mike Malone in Denver, Steve Clifford last year, and then Jamal Mosley this year. RJ Hampton is a guy that needs some stability and needs a role very carefully and clearly laid out to him. And I think that's where Hampton found his success this season. When Hampton was successful, it was because he was working off the ball. He was working as a three-point shooter. He was working as a defender. Where he got in trouble was when he tried to do too much, when he tried to attack the basket with reckless abandon, when he tried to play point guard. And it's not that he's not going to need to be able to do that down the road. It's just that's not his role today. That's not what he's good at. Hampton's future is really going to be so dependent on whether he accepts this role. Um, this is a really tricky thing for a lot of young players. They're used to being the guy on all their teams. RJ Hampton was probably the, you know, everywhere he went, he was the best player on the floor in the AAU circuit. Um, it, Australia was probably the first time he wasn't the best player on the floor. Or he wasn't the featured player on the floor. Um, going to Denver, being behind those guys, trying to find your role as a young player, but still trying to make your mark. That's a really difficult balance. Uh, and so RJ Hampton had moments of success this year as much as he had moments of failure, as much as he had moments where he struggled. This soft season is really going to be a, a, a statement to what kind of player do you think you're going to be, RJ Hampton? What kind of player do you want to be? And what kind of player does your team need you to be? And that's going to be the struggle for RJ Hampton. Now, a lot of good role players they figure this out quick. They say, hey, I'm not the guy on this team. There are lots of other players that are a whole lot better. And honestly, that's one of the problems I think the Magic do face uh, from a big picture standpoint is they don't have one clear guy. There's no pecking order. Um, this was a problem for the Magic during their last rebuild under, under Rob Hennigan. Um, there wasn't a clear pecking order. No one understood who, who was the top guy, and everyone just kind of tried to reach off each other and cannibalize each other and prove that they were that guy. And, and no one really took over that role. It's, it, it is a little bit of a problem. And again, that's, that's, that's one of the reasons I, I may talk a little bit about some of the draft experiences that I've been having over the last few days. Um, it's going to be one of the reasons why I think my big board is going to change the next time I, I put together my big board um, for Orlando magic daily.com. Hampton is a three and D player. And Jamal Mosley spent his entire season this year trying to convince Hampton to be a strong defender. And Hampton showed improvement defensively. There's, there's no getting around that. There's no um, denying that. Uh, he was a better defender um, this season, averaging 1.2 steals per 75 possessions, 2.1 deflections per 75 possessions. He is big enough, especially at the guard position, to be disruptive defensively. But like everything else, it speeds up for him a little bit too much. He gets over eager. He gets over excited and doesn't play with the poise and discipline that's going to be needed defensively. So again, the question for RJ Hampton as he moves forward into next season, as he moves forward and develops is, will he accept this role? Will he have the patience? Will he have the discipline not to go for seals, but to be solid and use his length to contest shots, to, to impede, to slow down, as much as to get steals, as much as to get deflections, as much as to get those stat plays on defense. That's what it's about. You look at the catch-all stats, R.J. Hampton had a really bad year. 
Statistically, RJ Hampton had a really bad year. Some of that is certainly because of the lineups that he played in. He was the point guard essentially for any deep bench lineup that the Magic had. That's obviously a, a lineup that's going to struggle. Um, he was off coming off a Magic bench that at times was really bad all season long and really, really struggled. And RJ Hampton was certainly part of that. I'm not absolving him of that. But the goal for our, but if you focus on RJ Hampton is did he kind of point toward where his role is going to be and what he's ultimately going to be in the NBA? In that sense, the season was a bit of a success. RJ Hampton did enough good things to make me think, okay, keep developing him, keep seeing what he can do. But a spot is not secured at all within the, the ecosystem of this young group. RJ Hampton still has a lot of work to do to get where he needs to be um, and, and get where the magic need him to be. And obviously, we're now in the third year of a rookie contract. It's time to really deliver and time to show that you're going to accept this role and be part of this team in that role. We'll talk a little bit about Gary Harris and how he found his groove once again as the Orlando Magic kind of saved the veteran's career. We'll get to that coming up here in just a moment. But first, a quick word from our pals at Shady Rays. Shady Rays is an independent sunglasses company that gives you the features of $200 sunglasses for a fraction of the price. That means polarized lenses, well-constructed, durable frames, and premium high-end finishes. Also something you won't find anywhere else is Shady Rays' insane protection program. Shady Rays includes loss and broken protection on every pair of sunglasses. They'll send you a brand new pair if you lose them, no matter what happened. Give them a try, and if you don't love them, you'll pay nothing. It's as simple as that. Plus, 10 meals are donated to fight hunger in America when you shop with Shady Rays. Exclusively for our listeners, head to ShadyRays.com and use code LOCKEDON to get 50% off two or more pairs of polarized sunglasses. That's code locked on for their best deal of the season. 50% off two or more pairs of Shady Ray sunglasses. They're backed by more than 150,000 verified five star reviews. Check them out today at shadyrays.com. We want to thank you for making Locked On Magic part of your day every day. For your next listen, check out the Locked On Now podcast. Nightly recaps of every NBA game with analysis from our local experts. It's free and available wherever you get podcasts. Gary Harris has been chasing an idea of Gary Harris. Um, that's, let's just leave it at that. In 2017, Gary Harris showed, I wouldn't say star potential, but he showed burst potential, averaging 17 points per game on efficient three-point shooting. He was a key part in the Denver Nuggets' early rebuild and as, as, they, as they looked for an answer in the, in the days after, um, after Andre Iguodala left, left them. Um, in the day, you know, obviously the end of the Carmelo Anthony era, the end of the Allen Iver- Carmelo Anthony, Allen Iverson, and, and Chauncey Billups, and, and all those guys. The... The Denver Nuggets were searching for answers, and Gary Harris gave them a brief reprieve and gave them uh, someone that could, like I said with R.J. Hampton, fit a role. Gary Harris was eager to defend, was eager to be a spot-up shooter, and was proficient at it until he wasn't. Gary Harris, like I said, has always been chasing that mythical 2022 season. He's always been chasing, um, chasing that idea of who he is and and what he's capable of doing and, and and that career season that he had. It's been difficult for him to get back to those levels. And everyone certainly still believed that he could. But eventually, again, Denver kind of ran out of time. Denver's window was open. They saw an opportunity to add a big wing that they were missing after after letting Jeremy Grant walk in free agency and Aaron Gordon, they ran out of time. And they gave Gary Harris to the Orlando Magic where, you know, a veteran might honestly go quietly and end his career with on a rebuilding team. But this was also opportunity. Um, the Orlando Magic are a team with plenty of opportunity. They needed veteran leadership. They needed some shooting. They certainly were willing to give Gary Harris the time and the space and the energy that he needed to get better, to prove that he still had it, whatever it is, that he still had it. And it's undoubted that Gary Harris was successful in that this season. This was a good Gary Harris season. In fact, Gary Harris pretty much got his groove back. 
He played, at, you know, certainly not at that 2017 level, but he looked like the guy that that was so key to the Denver Nuggets beating the Utah Jazz 3-1 in that playoff series as a defender and was a, a solid shooter for a team that desperately needed needed it. 2018 season, excuse me, I for say, saying misstating the year earlier. The 2018 season, he averaged 17.5 points per game and 39.6% from beyond the arc. The Orlando Magic don't need him to do that. No one does. They, but they need him to have the season that he had this year. Um, Harris averaged 11.1 points per game and shot 38.4% from beyond the arc. It was his best scoring numbers since 2019 and his best shooting numbers since that 2018 season. So again, just think of that. It's That's the Gary Harris that everyone imagines, that everyone knows they, that they're going to get. A dependable defender, a reliable three-point shooter, the prototypical 3-N-D guard. Harris was simply lead as a corner three-point shooter too, making 46.5% of his corner threes um, on 2.3 att- corner three-point attempts per game, the eighth most in the league, which is, you know, again, pretty astounding considering the Magic are such a poor three-point shooting team and a poor offensive team. Gary Harris is the first Magic player to rank in the top 20 in corner three-point attempts per game since Ryan Anderson in 2012. They haven't had anyone in the top 10 in that mark since Jason Richardson in 2011. So again, when I talk about the Magic started to modernize their offense a little bit, started to get more corner threes, which they absolutely did. Um, you know, they blew away their corner three point mark from 2020 uh, in the 72, uh, well before the 72 game mark. Um, Gary Harris was a really valuable piece of this puzzle, um, and, and Gary Harris showed that he can get back to that level. Defensively, Gary Harris was also excellent. With Harris, the Magic had a minus 5.9 net rating with Harris on the floor um, with improvements on both offense and defense, including a, a 110.1 defensive rating. With Harris off the floor, they were a minus 9.6 net rating with a 112 defensive rating. Harris averaged 1.3 steals per 75 possessions. According to Basketball Index, they rated his defense at plus 0.68, placing with the 75th percentile of that metric. Again, Orlando was 19th in the league overall in defensive rating. They had some really bad defensive moments. Gary Harris was not really a part of those. He did a good job defensively. So again, Gary Harris did everything that is asked. When we talk about the need for RJ Hampton to understand his role, Gary Harris understood his role. He understood his assignment. He understood what his job on this team was. The Magic won a few games because Gary Harris was good and was, was shooting the ball extremely well. And yes, the Magic probably sat Gary Harris as a healthy scratch late in the season because he would have helped them win a lot. There's a reason now that we're sitting here saying, hey, maybe the Magic should re-sign Gary Harris. Maybe they should keep Gary Harris. Maybe Gary Harris wants to stay and be part of this rebuild. No one would blame him if he didn't. No one would blame him if he wanted to go chase a championship or go sign with a, with a title contender. But if the, Mag- the Magic have cap room to burn and certainly could give a front-loaded deal to take care of Gary Harris and thank him and thank him for helping this team out and Hope that he will continue to do so. Harris needed this bounce back year more than anyone. And if you're a veteran, this is the kind of opportunity and this is the kind of thing you want to see from a young team. The Magic took care of their guy. They took care of this player. They gave him the chance to get healthy. They gave him the chance to succeed. They gave him the chance to prove that he can still do it. And I would bet Gary Harris is going to be one of the most sought after free agents among contending teams this season. Don't think he'll get the mid-level exception. Uh, but maybe he will. Um, but the ma- but he's going to be in demand this offseason because he played that well this season. He played that particularly well this season. Does that bode well for the Magic in hopes of resigning him? No, but it also shows how badly the Magic need to make sure they keep some veteran help. If they're going to trade Terrence Ross and they're going to lose Gary Harris, they need to make sure they have a veteran in place because that's going to make the team better. Think about what Ricky Rubio was doing for Cleveland this year. Think about, you know, again, look at, I'm trying to look at other other young teams that we have here. I'm looking up at my board here. Um, you know, look look at what C.J. McCollum's done for New Orleans, to be perfectly honest. Look what Pat Beverly's done for Minnesota. You're going to need a veteran like Gary Harris. And, and Gary was a great veteran. He, you know, he did the work. He put the time in, and he's going to get the reward for it as well. Gary Harris had a fantastic season, and most importantly, 
he got his groove back this year. And that's what makes it such a good season. I've been doing a couple mock drafts lately. I'll talk about some things that I've learned and, and where I'm kind of sitting on the NBA draft process at this point. Um, we'll, we'll be talking plenty draft as we get closer to the, closer to the NBA draft lottery here in a, in, in a couple weeks now. Um, but first, let's get a quick word from our pals at Built Bar. Look, it's almost May. We're coming up on the midpoint of the season. Summer is here. And yeah, that does mean beach weather is coming. It's always beach weather here in Florida. But for those of you not in Florida, it's almost beach time. We get it. We get it. We get it. And and you got to make sure you're taking care of your body. You got to make sure you're taking care of yourself. You got to make sure you're taking care that you have the energy to get through your entire day, whether it's sitting at work, whether it's working out, whether it's being out at the beach, being out the parks, wherever. That's why I turn to Built Bar. They're really the first protein bar that I eat regularly. I'm not a big protein bar person. I'm not big in little supplement, supplements because a lot of it, they don't taste good. Built Bar is completely different because they do taste good. They do taste like what they say on the packaging. And they deliver for you. Built Bar is built bars are protein bars that taste like candy bars. They're covered in 1% real chocolate and come in great flavors. There are there's a churro flavor. We all love churros here in Central Florida. We know who makes the best churros, Universal Studios. Um, but these are delicious. They do taste like churros. They have the nice marshmallowy taste as well because they come in the puffs um, brand that they have here at Built Bar. Go to Built.com and check out all the different flavors they have to offer, as well as the macros. You'll be blown away. Most Built Bars contain 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, 4 net carbs, and 17 grams of protein. Again, they come in great flavors. It's not just churro. There's mint brownie, cookie, coconut, coconut almond. Uh, I think there's a German chocolate flavor they got offer, offered now, which is delicious. Um, I've got a blueberry muffin one that, that from, a, from a, a, a promo sale from a few months ago. Still delicious. Uh, I don't know if that one's still available yet, but uh, but there are some delicious flavors as well. And yeah, yeah, they do bring out the pumpkin in fall, if you're wondering. Go to built.com and use promo code LOCK15 and get 15% off your organ. Use promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at built.com. So if you've been following me on Orlando Magic Daily at Omagic Daily on Twitter, I've been doing a take-a-thon spin every single day, just one spin, just kind of throwing it out there. It's both the show, and, and I think we'll go over some of those results as we get closer to the lottery just to say, like, okay, this is how that breaks down if you just spin one time per day. But um, we got a lot of sixes. The last two days, we got ones. Um, the first time we've gotten ones in our spin. And, and again, it's, it's really an experiment to show that how random the lottery can be. If you're just spinning it once, if you're just doing the lottery once, anything can happen. Um, we know what the percentages are, obviously, 52.1% to land in the top four, 14% to get the top pick, but it is random. So the most likely outcome is still the magic land with the fifth or sixth pick. And uh, most, I think since the NBA went to the new lottery odds, at least two teams jump up into the top four. And obviously the Orlando Magic have not won a pick determined by the lottery since Victor Oladipo in 20. 13, uh, and they have not improved their draft position in the NBA draft lottery since drafting Chris Weber in 1993. So again, if you wonder why I don't trust the lottery, why I don't think the lottery system is something you should put your faith in, this is my experiment to show that yes, it 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 can reward you sometimes, but it can also um, it it also isn't something you should put all your eggs in the basket for, um, which is obviously something the Magic have kind of done this year. We'll see where they land on May 17th, of course, but. For the first time, I, I've been landing with the top pick. Um, I, I've been doing a mock draft project with our friend Richard Stamen of, of Locked On NBA Draft. Um, uh, and I got I had the second pick in that draft. And and, and I, you know, Chet Holmgren went number one. I was surprisingly left with a really difficult choice uh, between Paolo Bancaro and, and Jabari Smith. Um, on my big board for the last few months, I've had Jabari Smith as my number one guy. Um, like I said, like I've said on previous podcasts, I really see him as a mix of Seattle Rashard Lewis, as well as Orlando Rashard Lewis. He's a great defender, a great three-point shooter. My, you know, my only concern with him is he's not much of a shot creator. He's not much of a give the ball to him and create. But again, that's something you can develop over time. That's something that you can continue to, to continue to, to improve at. And, and of course, all these guys are super, super young. But you know, you watch these playoffs and you watch the game, the, the games that matter most. Um, you know, you watch what John ja Morant did at the end of tonight, uh, at the end of uh, the game. Uh, on on Tuesday, you watch, you know, how Anthony Edwards was able to hit that shot to tie that game, or you watch Chris Paul kind of dominating the game, and or, or the way Jason Tatum closed out the Brooklyn Nets, or Jalen Brown closed out the Brooklyn Nets on on Monday night. You watch all these players, 
And it just becomes increasingly clear that it is just, it, once again, the playoffs, once you get to the games that matter, it's really difficult to win if you don't have a guy that can just get you a bucket. Um, you know, everyone was asking John Morant, what did you see on that game winning basket? Uh, how did that develop? And, and John Morant was like, you know what? They called my number. I just had to get a bucket. I just had to go get a basket. Um, and, and you look back at, at the Magic in 2019 and 2020 and why they failed in the playoffs. And it's frankly because they didn't have any creation. They didn't have any ability to create off the dribble. Everything had everything was a struggle because there was no one that could break a play and get a basket. Um, again, Tracy McGrady would have killed for the teammate for for the members of that 2019 team because you put Tracy McGrady on that team, that's a dangerous team all of a sudden. That's better than any team Tracy McGrady played on, um, you know, because they have some shooting to spread the floor. And again, I talked about it a little bit earlier. It puts everyone in the right roles. Um, every no one's having to do too much because there's a clear guy that's number one that you're pushing to the front. But we all hope from Jalen Suggs, and maybe it was a, a, a bad ho- a bad hope or, or a missed scout on that, we all hoped he'd be a guy that could score 20 points, create his own shot off the dribble, hit a, hit a shot off the bounce, hit a step back, hit, hit all those difficult shots. Part of Orlando's problem is Cole Anthony is that guy on this team. And again, I like Cole Anthony. I think Cole's a, 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 pre, a really good player, but he really struggled on switching defenses. When defenses switched out on him, he couldn't break them apart. He couldn't break them down. Certainly couldn't do it consistently. He ended up settling uh, for tough mid-range jumpers. He ended up really, he ended up struggling to finish at the rim. It it was bad. And so, you know, without officially changing it on my big board, I've been taking Paolo Bancaro over Jabari Smith in a lot of my mock drafts and a lot of my, and a lot of my uh, thought experiments about this draft. You can go look at my mock draft on OrlandoMagicDaily.com, where I left the Magic at the second pick. Um, I, I believe I had Houston taking Jabari Smith in that draft, so that that, that made my choice a little bit easier. Um, but I am continually taking Paolo first, and, and the reason is because Paolo can create his own shot. Um, as I've been kind of having these discussions and as, as I've kind of been um, talking with other Magic fans and, and getting their feel for for what they think of think of this, or, or kind of putting test balloon ide- ideas and arguments out there, I'm seeing a lot of people claim that Paolo is a center, and and I'm been kind of surprised by that because I view him very much as a wing. I feel very comfortable playing him alongside a Jonathan Isaac or alongside a Franz Wagner. I, I do agree he needs to continue to improve his three point shot, but uh, there are plenty of signs that he can get there. There's plenty of signs that he can continue to develop an out uh, a more consistent outside shot. Um, but he can work the mid range really well and he can work that low block pretty well. And he's got good footwork in the post. And, you know, I, 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 I think Paolo to me is a guy in this draft that most plays like a star. Um, and I think has the most talent to get to that level. Um, and so that's where I'm kind of sitting right now is, is the biggest need the magic have the biggest thing they have to fill is getting a guy who can create his own shot. Um, and, and get his own baskets and score efficiently and effectively um, off the dribble. Um, they just they just don't have that. Um, you know, again, I think that's a big area where Franz Wagner needs to develop is develop a two dribble pull up to the free throw line. Once he can hit that mid range jumper, once he can hit that shot off the dribble, he's going to be really tough to stop because he has all the other tools. Um, I, I think Paolo Paolo has that shot in his game. Paolo can do all that. The, the, the flaw in Paolo's game right now is his three-point shooting. And, and I think some people question whether he has the athleticism to, to compete at, at, at a high level. But I, I'm frankly not as concerned about that because I think he can get to the basket. I think he can take advantage of mismatches. And I think that he can score off the dribble. And I think that's, to me, that's the biggest need the Magic have. And, and so that's that's kind of the latest draft thought I've had as, as I've been kind of breaking down these guys. Um, you know, I'm still digging into the tape. I'm not committed to anybody yet. Um, but I would say right now I'm very much leaning toward Paolo as the number one guy on my board as, as I've begun to look and think about this class uh, a little bit more. We'll have plenty of time to talk about the NBA draft. Again, we're going to do a uh, Twitter spaces on at Omagic Daily on Friday at 5.30 p.m. It's our mock draft Friday, so we'll run a run a tankathon, go through some of these thought experiments at, together. and I'll, I'll be fr- I'm happy to answer any questions you have about the Orlando Magic as well as the draft process. Um at least that I'm able to answer. I'm still doing my study on some guys, especially guys later in, in that first round, because I do think the Magic are a candidate to move into the first round, back into the first round of the draft, um, using Terrence Ross as uh, as a uh, bait for that. Um, so I do I do think that that 
you know, we'll have plenty of time to talk about the NBA draft and we'll definitely talk more about it um, in the very, very near future. But that's going to do it for me today. I want to thank you all again for listening to today's episode of Locked on Magic. Of course, find us on Twitter at Locked on Magic. Subscribe to the podcast and Apple Podcasts. Search your tuning in Himalaya, Google Play, Spotify, Odyssey, and all the fun places on the podcast to your podcast-enabled listening device. You can find me on Twitter at Philip R underscore and being, of course, for the latest on the Orlando Magic. Be sure to check out orlandomagicdaily.com. You can follow me, follow us there on Twitter at omagicdaily. That's going to do it for me today, though. I want to thank you all again for listening to today's episode of Locked on Magic. For Orlando Magic Daily and Locked on Magic, this has been Philip Ross. See you all again next time for another episode of Locked on Magic.